Welcome to the CDI CTO Podcast presented by CDI Studios. All right, welcome everybody to the latest episode of the CDI CTO Podcast. So this is actually part two of a series where we're introducing a lot of the, uh, we call it divisional CTOs here at CDI. So I'm joined with three of, of my colleagues from the office of the CTO, uh, Jason McHenry, Will Sauter, and Russell Pope. So. Um, we, we in, in episode one, right, we sat down with you know, three of, of your teammates, and um, we basically just wanted to do a little bit of an interview roundtable discussion and uh, introduce you all to, to the podcast, um, which really is in preparation for you all being able to sit down and host your own episodes uh-huh. of the, the CTO podcast with various different guests, whether they be partners, customers, other employees, um, you name it. So. Uh, we're going to run through a similar format. I'm going to ask a lot of the similar questions and just get your perspectives on those questions. Uh, but first, before we go too far into it, if you could each um, just sort of introduce yourself, spend a couple minutes talking about you and the, specifically the pillar of the, the go-to-market framework that you represent, and, uh, and we'll get the conversation rolling there. So we're going to go in the order of, of uh, tenure, longest tenured uh, on this team, <laughs> uh, outside of myself, of course. So Jason, we'll start with you. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, Jason McHenry. Um, so, I'm the CTO of the uh, digital workspace uh, pillar. Um, so, covering everything from uh, telephony to conferencing, uh, you know, VDI, endpoint management, kind of everything that's directly end user facing. Um, and kind of our drive in, in in that pillar right now is kind of uh, you know, creating a um, you know an easy to approach, easy to use kind of work. Experience for you know the end users and kind of tying all that together into you know something that just flows and gets out of their way and lets them get their job done. Nice, nice, cool. It's an interesting time, right? For oh, that, for that, that. More absolutely. important than ever, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll dig into that in a little bit. Will, why don't you go next? Yeah, uh, Will Sauter, divisional CTO over hybrid cloud infrastructure. Uh, so everything within the four walls of the data center, plus public cloud, uh, storage, backup. You know, how do we do things the right way with regards to resiliency? Make sure we, we can come back from a disaster if we need to. Uh, networking infrastructure, software-defined networking, right? Cloud transit. Um, so yeah, that's oh, a. Awesome. So that's all. That's all. <laughs> right. It's things. all the things that got us here, but you know, all this new fancy stuff will eventually come back. The new down. versions of those. The new things, versions, right? Yes. It ebbs and flows. So I'll be important once again. What's old is new, and what's new is old. <laughs> exactly. Well, and to our newest member, uh, Russell Pope. Go ahead. So yeah, my name is Russell Pope. Uh, I'm a CTO for our modern applications practice. That uh, basically means that I look after everything around like developer experience, uh, containerizing your applications using tools like Kubernetes and sort of all the adjacent technologies there to make things work. Uh, I think uh, effective adoption of, of, of public cloud and building those cloud native applications uh, falls into uh, my purview as well. And also things like developer experience and secure software supply chain and, and, and all the things that that may entail. Very cool. Mm-hmm. So, so two of the three of you actually joined, much like in, on episode one, actually all three joined from acquired companies, right, that, that CDI acquired mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. over the last couple of years. So, so Jason, why don't you talk about so, sort of how you got here, uh, maybe even before the, the Plan B acquisition, sort of how you got to become a divisional CTO sure. uh, from your, your early stages of your career. Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, well, I guess going all the way back, I mean, I've always been a tech nerd. Uh, if it plugs into a wall, has a battery, whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm all over it. And so um, I went into college thinking, like, I want to be a programmer. You know, I want to be a developer. Okay. And got there and kind of dug into it and realized, nah, I don't want to do this day to day. And I got really lucky because I took an infrastructure uh, course with um, uh, uh, an adjunct professor at, at my college who actually was the CTO for uh, like a local regional telecom. Okay. And we went out to his site and you know, as part of the class and kind of like dug into like, you know, what's in this, this um, you know, regional office, you know, telephony switches, I mean, you name it, it was there. And it was just like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And so I kind of dug into it from there and, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, becoming, you know, a generalist. Um, I was a, uh, you know, a, a, an administrator and engineer at you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, and then a law firm, and you know some others, and kind of through that, um, you know, I, I had a lot of exposure to uh, to Citrix, and it was one of these things where um, infrastructure engineers fall into two categories. Ninety-eight percent of them don't want to have anything to do with the end user <laughs> if it's applicated, <laughs> right? <laughs> and 
yeah, the, the rest of us are, eh, okay, I'll put up with it enough to, and, and so, yeah, the, the, you know, there was this niche there that, um, you know, it just kind of kept recurring in, you know, in my career, and I got more and more exposure to it, um, and, you know, kind of dug in on that side, and, you know, so eventually ended up at uh, Plan B Technologies, which was, you know, an amazing experience. Um, yeah, I had some great owners there. They built a really cool company. Um, and then, you know, we, we formed a relationship with CDI, you know, had that whole history. Um, and we had a kind of really good luck in, in, in really kind of being first in the door, you know. Sorry, sorry, Will. <laughs> but, um, because, uh, you know, CDI was super welcoming. Um, it, uh, yeah, I've been through acquisitions, uh, well, primarily in the financial space, and they were always knife fights. And, you know, CDI, yeah. like, this, this was completely different. It was this, all right, well, how do we combine all of this in a really effective way and, like, make it actually work? You know, we want to keep all these talented resources we have. We want to find a home for everybody and kind of, you know, kind of make it work. And, you know, so the companies came together, found a way to, you know, really tap Kind of the you know the talent pools and you know it's been really cool to watch that kind of continue through the subsequent acquisitions. So so you mentioned the acquisition. Um, what is the biggest thing you learned going through that process, and what might be something that you would give somebody um, some advice that you might give them, whether they're going like going through an acquisition because it sounds like you've experienced good and, and bad. Sure. Right. So I mean it it it, it depends on the acquisition, but. Um, I mean, to, to a degree, the chips are going to fall where they do. Um, but where it is in your control, you know, keep an open mind. Look for the opportunities. There's always an opportunity in, in, in those coming together to, to differentiate and, and, and provide something that the combined organization needs. Um, it's really easy to fall into kind of a negative, you know, doom and gloom mindset. Sure. And, you know, if you can avoid that, the opportunities are generally going to be there. Stay positive. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell us your story? From the beginning. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hope we have enough uh, tape or memory or whatever that is. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, I was tied to computers from a very young age. Uh, my father was a deck engineer. We lived on a remote island in Lake Michigan, and he flew his own plane, telecommuted, right? Uh, and he was gone all week, and I was at home. And the only way I could keep in touch with him at, during the time was deck mail. So I'd get in the vax and do my thing, and he'd log it. He'd dial in and do 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 right? Mode him in and... He'd write back to me. And uh, so I was like, I think my first email was first grade. So we're going back to like 87, 87. A um, couple of modem. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so it was an island, and everyone was long distance. And he brought 56K frame relay over. I was the uh, on-site administrator at the school. So I was tapped <laughs> on the shoulder in fifth grade. I was, the, I was the cool kid. Everyone called when they got modem busy because I could, you know, kill poor. Okay, try it now. Right? I had the back door in. <laughs> um, Ultimately moved into, uh, you know, the quote mainland uh, and specific into the automotive space. So right around that time, right, shop floor automation was just coming into play, instrumenting mold cavities with various sensors and taking that data in. And, uh, you know, I was teaching folks who had never seen a mouse before, we got to hold it this way and, right, this is how you move the cursor. And so I was always interfacing with people, right, uh, but just love technology. Uh, caught myself in a little deer motorcycle accident. Uh, throughout the quest for parts, ended up with some extra bikes and traded two, uh, two Harleys for a storage array. Love this. <laughs> that was uh, freshman year of high school. So I spent the, the summer learning high voltage differential SCSI and reading the big books and all this stuff and the stuff you weren't supposed to know in ninth grade, let alone without going to all sorts of courses, right? And that was it. So I'd like, you know, spent I was striping the lights in a certain pattern. Look at this way and what's the most efficient? And then, you know, just beating things up. So I just love tech. Uh, Keep at it. Uh, take risks, right? Uh, auto industry collapsed, got on LinkedIn, and I found a, the company who acquired, or what was acquired by CDI most yep. recently, ClearPath Solutions Group. Uh, started as a sales engineer in 2011, and uh, ended up as, as, a, as a principal by the time we, that we ended up uh, putting it back on the market for sale. So I uh, ran sales engineering there for quite a number of years, and yep. just I know a lot about a lot, and I, there's always more to learn. So. Drink and I know things. I we drink and I know things, yes. <laughs> we joke that Will downloads the internet every night. Well, so that, yeah, so I'm going through some, well, not to get too into it, but I've had some issues recently with some headaches, and someone said, you finally filled it up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Awesome. Yes. 
That is funny. So. Russell, how about you? Your, your, your path to CDI is different than, yeah. than the it, others. You so. know, my, my, my path uh, probably began with a night out with beer and you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to kind of go back in the olden days, one, one of the reasons strategy. I'm not in the whole end user compute is I actually did a brief uh, stint in ISP tech support, uh, you know, talking to old ladies, trying to get them to type their passwords oh. in the right way and things like that. And I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> uh, I got into sysadmin work uh, way back in Louisiana, uh, back when being an ISP sysadmin was the coolest thing ever and having shell accounts uh, and just kind of developed and built on those skills uh, over time. I ended up going to work for a, uh, a tiny little vertically spe specific integrator uh, in New Orleans. We service like the printing and prepress industry doing like a lot of automation stuff and things like that. And being the, the, the one guy on the team that knew like Irix and Solaris and Linux, uh, they were like, we need you to go mm -hmm. and be our expert at Fiber Channel. And we need you to be our expert because you've got a background in networking and like data center networking. And so, you know, just really, really just like trial by fire, uh, you know, back when you could sell like a terabyte of storage, it took up a rack and it cost like $4 million. Uh, <laughs> You know, and then I discovered the wonderful world of VMware. Uh, you know, this was back in 2004, 2005. Uh, you know, vMotion was the coolest thing ever. Uh, so I was like, well, I'm going to sharpen those yeah. knives and well, see if I can do yeah. something. When that happened, that was pretty damn yeah, no, that was Oh, yeah. 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 And I remember demoing <laughs> yeah. my boss, and I was like, check this out. And I would play a, I'd create a Windows server, and I had a, a, a QuickTime movie I was playing off, streaming off of a, a SIF share on it. Yep. And I moved it from another server, uh, one server to the other, and it didn't skip a beat. Didn't and he's like, holy moly, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, so I developed some of those skills back in the ESXi 2.5 days, and then I was like, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to go to Silicon Valley and be the best darn VMware guy I can possibly be. And I figured if I can make it out there, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, have yet to move back in with mom, so happy about that. <laughs> uh, so I went out there and started a career in consulting, uh, working with customers on like you know adopting virtualization and then gradually moving into like things like automation and automation technology. Always dragging my 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 networking background in there with me. Uh, I felt like that was a, a major asset, so I was always able to kind of straddle and have these conversations with the storage people because I understood their concerns, mm -hmm. and the network people because I got their concerns, and then eventually the app devs and those folks because I was doing like a lot of automation work for them and, and, and solving problems there. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, started running uh, teams of, of, of folks, kind of like developing practices from the ground up, uh, you know, built an OpenStack practice uh, from the ground up, a config management practice, you know. We, we all have our missteps in life. I actually spent most of my career in doing OpenStack convincing people not to do OpenStack because I would always ask the customer, why do you want to go to OpenStack? And their answer was always something about cutting the spend with particular vendors and OEMs. And I'm like, that's not a good reason to do that. Uh, and like, here's why people are adopting it and how they're successful at it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really kind of learning to get in front of problems before they became uh, major issues. Um, and then, you know, uh, started going to uh, VMware Partner Advisory Boards where uh, I met Mr. Will That's Huber. Where we met. Uh, you know, this was probably like eight years ago or yeah. so. And, uh, you know, I was the chatty guy in the, in the thing that was, I had no fear uh, asking questions. You have, of, no, uh, you have no fear. Some, <laughs> some of these product uh, managers and things like that. Uh, I was always very constructive in my questions and feedback, but I was like, I was not holding back uh, just because I, I was like, I'm, you know. Russell was always the guy that would ask the question we we all wanted to ask. Yeah, but the room gasped. Really like, yeah. to ask I had it written down. I just don't well, yeah. asked, but they all leaned forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah pretty much. Uh, and so Will and I had always kept in touch. You know, whenever we'd go and overlap uh, into various like you know training events and things like that, we would always go out for beers. Uh, you know, we've probably spent four or five nights at Trillium. Uh, don't yeah. don't know that any of us remember them, it's but uh, th 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 those were uh, those those were good times. And then. Uh, I reached out to Will at the beginning of the year, and I was like, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm looking for something cool to do. Uh, you know, can we figure out something? And uh, Will was like, yeah, let's figure something out. And here I am, and I'm happy there to be go. here. We're happy you're here, too. All right, so uh, I want to talk about, um, you're all obviously very deep into your careers, right? You've been in IT and technology for a long time. Did you just call us old? I I don't know. Well, it, it's it's well, just going to go another shade of golden, my friend. <laughs> At least you have it. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true. We have um, tells. <laughs> so I asked this question to a lot of people who are you know further into their careers. Like if you were giving a young person advice who was looking to get into our field today, mm -hmm. um, what might you tell them? Where would you sort of what, what, what advice would you give them? Would you advise that they go down like a specific path, like a? I talk. 
to software development I, or security. I, I tell my son this all the time. Security. Right? So, so what do you Yeah, so, so the analogy I would use, and I'm not a big RPG game player, but, you know, you, you, wouldn't pick the, you wouldn't pick the character who had a level 10 in this, right, with no gold or stone. Or, I know, I'm just making stuff up. I don't know this You've stuff. You've never played Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I never have, actually. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, you're looking for a well-rounded individual, right? You want to know what the, what the effect is of, a, of something over here, right? It, you know, just because you're a mile deep in Python, if you have no TCP background and no networking 101 and you don't understand virtuals, you have to know it all. You have to know enough yeah. about it. Maybe specialize in something, right? But don't don't only just know this and rely on everyone else around you to tell you the right thing, right? I think we're we're like right now. If you're coming out of college and you've got a cybersecurity background, I mean, you can almost write your own you know check. Um, and I don't think that trend's going to change anytime soon. It kind of plays into it's, it's a gold it's a gold it rush is, though. It, it, well, it is, but I mean, yeah. and, and you do need that you, you got to stand above background. You know, you can't be effective in the security context without knowing. Sure. Well, you can. There's plenty of threat hunters out. Sorry to, you know, <clears throat> but, you know, there's plenty of threat hunters out there that'll just look at logs and look for an indicator, right? But if you don't, you know, as you're unwinding that, uh, that, that hay bale, right, if you don't know how this is talked into this and there's a service account over here right. and that's, oh, hey, if I look at that, you know, at the logged in users, that's going to tell me from this API maybe where the backup server is, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of interconnection. And if, if all you're doing is looking for something that's anomalous, you know, I think that I don't think that's quite as effective as understanding the whole yeah. enchilada, right? I, I would I would say, and I think a lot of folks fall into this trap, uh, especially coming up early. You know, they're like, "Oh, I'm going to be a best darn network engineer, the best darn security engineer, or whatever." And where your career starts, and you know, where the sun starts to set on your career, are not necessarily going to be the same place. You know, if you if you go and you learn how to uh, you know design and build cars. Uh, because that's your passion. You know, you're, you're, you're always going to be designing and building cars. You might have some new tech and things like that, but fundamentally, a car is a car is a car. Uh, you know, when I look at like my own my own progression, uh, just the evolution of technology. You know, like things like Frame Relay and ISDN have kind of gone away. You know, we've gone from like uh, you know uh, hubs to switches. Uh, you know, we, we were doing like layer two everywhere because that was the fast way to do anything. Now you can't buy a switch on the market without it doing line rated layer three. I mean, there's a Linsys on the shelf that. Uh, you mm -hmm. can probably do that at this point, right? Uh, so you should always be evolving and looking ahead and, and learning new things. Never stop learning and developing your skill sets because, you know, like say, I, I thought I was going to be like an ISP sysadmin from, you know, now until the heat death of the universe. And as I kind of grew and developed my skill, I found I had certain talents and skills and abilities uh, that kind of nudged me in general. Like, I was terrified of programming when I was in college. I was like, I do not want to do this at all. And, and now, you know, I, I, I often sit down and I support different projects, writing some code for them to get things done, uh, you know, mentoring like our automation folks to figure things out. Uh, and, you know, I never thought I would ever be like leading the charge in things. You know, I always figured I would be just like, you know, the, the, the NCO in the back, like waiting for the lieutenant to tell me what to do and then I'll you know, do whatever he says, right? Uh, and now it's like, hey, you know, now I'm responsible for like, how do we talk about these things? Right. And so just... Don't just say, hey, I'm going to be the best darn security guy in the world. I mean, you, you, you can and should, but what that looks like today and what that's going to look like five years from now may not well, be I wanna, remotely I want to ask you that because your background is in infrastructure, yeah. right? networking and infrastructure, and now you're the CTO of a modern applications division mm -hmm. of CDI. So, like, that's not an easy transition. No, There's it's... a lot of people who are infrastructure-minded who are trying to cross... Mm -hmm. you know, like streams. Into right. And there's a lot of folks who think that they're modern application folks and they have no infrastructure background, yeah, right? Which yeah, is the whole exactly. other issue, right? We, we, and, and it's problematic it's, on both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. did you do that? Like, what, you, you know, I, I think a lot of it uh, came to like a lot of the customers I was interacting with uh, in, in, in prior lives and just, you know, I spent a lot of time like working with developers and solving their problems uh, and like developing good like sense around things like automation and things like that, which really starts getting me thinking about like, you know, building applications and, and, and how that happens and, and connecting the context to developer problems, right? Uh, and, and it really just kind of helped me become conversant in that. And then it's like, okay, now let me start understanding what that technology landscape is. Like, what are their concerns? You know, like, you know, we all, we all like to joke that developers, you know, don't know anything about infrastructure and, you know, it's not their job necessarily to know. They should know enough to be dangerous and they should know enough to when to ask and say, hey, well, mm -hmm. I want to do these things. I need to store like 80 terabytes of stuff somewhere. And like, what's the best way to do that? And like, here are my, like, 
being able to do that, mm -hmm. not just going down to Fry's, if that still exists anymore, I don't know if it does or not, Fries. Uh, and picking up a couple of two terabyte not in, not uh, <laughs> uh, USB drives and saying, why can't we just store our mission critical database on this Drobo I picked up at nah, Fry's? For right. Heard about this yesterday, right? actually, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, well, to your point, like that, that's a good point. Like an, a developer that doesn't know anything about infrastructure, if they did know something about infrastructure, to your point earlier, like that probably makes them a better developer. Uh, you know, I, a long time ago before interpret, right, the, folks had a certain, they had confines, right? They had confines they had to work within. And now the sky's the limit, right? Yeah. We need more, we just make yeah. more, and it's inefficient code. And there's, it's not, you know, the, it's, it's not, I think that the skills have, the skills have diluted for sure, right? But you used yeah. to have to know more about what you were doing than you do now. Yep. And I think that the, the successful ones are ones who don't lose that, that, that baseline. It's, like, it's that mythical full stack engineer. That yep. enough, yeah. Just enough about it that you know how it works. You don't need to necessarily you know, know how to configure it from soup to nuts, but sure. you know. You should probably know how DNS fundamentally works or sure. something like that. Right. Certain things, sure. yeah, of course. Um, but, and, uh, actually, well, yeah, they, you should, because instead of hard coding IPs, right, they make our job a hell of a lot. <laughs> well, see, yeah. now we use service discovery to solve yeah, you, you, Yes, yes. Well, I, mean, yes. You're about, I mean, it's understanding cross impact. You know, okay, if I want to do a thing, I've got to think, you know, three steps downstream. I, I may not need to know how to configure the storage, but I need to know, yeah. you know, what kind of I.O. I'm going to be putting on it. Right. And, yes. Know. Yes. It, yes. Actually, uh, the, uh, another thing I did want to touch on that, that, that just popped into my head is, you know, as we start looking at building these highly available applications, for years we've all thrown infrastructure at the problems. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of outages related to the infrastructure complexity that we've thrown at these problems to solve for <laughs> this app can never go down. And so, you know, over the years, I've kind of learned that pushing that sort of intelligence up into the application layer, which Netflix is famous for this, right, with, you know, their Chaos Gorilla and Chaos Monkey and things mm -hmm. like that, uh, you know, that's, that's the place you should be doing that so that the infrastructure can be, like, simplified, normalized, and delivering a specific set of capabilities that is just consumed by the app developers as needed. And they do all the smart intelligence stuff in, in, in the stack, not, not, not making you do it or you do it because of, mm -hmm. you know, well, that's that. That leads right into you know all the 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 different reasons folks are moving to hyperscalers or public clouds, right? It's oh my, I don't want to be left behind, and my neighbor did it, and lift and shift, and you see the right way to lift and shift, and I don't know that there is necessarily maybe a right way to lift and shift, right? The the, the more the the more you remove the the more you lose the ability to provide infrastructure crutches, the more yeah. you have to focus on proper architecture, and if you're not doing that, you're going to set yourself yeah, up for failure. That's right? the thing. Lift and shift is generally not the right way to go no, to the cloud, right? No. You want to take a cloud native approach, uh, you know, to pick a pedestrian example, yeah, I can go spin up an EC2 instance, install SQL server on it, and boom, I got a database server, but now I'm paying for a SQL license, mm -hmm. I'm paying for an, uh, an, uh, an instance that's uh, probably like an on-demand instance, so I'm paying a 3x premium for that, and it's another endpoint I have to support, backup, maintain, secure, etc. Why sure. don't I just go buy an RDS instance <laughs> instead uh, to provide the same level of feature right. comfort? Uh, capability, and I don't have to deal with all those other problems, and now it's actually potentially cheaper. Well, honestly, that's the cool thing about your space, because, you know, okay, well, we, we pushed all these services out to public cloud, and everybody said, well, that's awesome, but it's expensive, so I want to be able to consume all of that in the private cloud. Every, Great, that's an awesome idea. How the hell do we do that? And so, like, that's yeah. been the answer, is, is you, know, the, you know, DevOps, the modern, you know, modern app space, like, we're actually seeing that realized now, and, like, that's, that's been that, you know, that vehicle. I mean, yeah, we're starting to see stuff like, you know, Azure Stack HCI and the public cloud vendors pushing that, you know, back into the data center, but it's all proprietary. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. so. But I think one of the secret sauces to cloud isn't necessarily the fact that I can go and get a VM or a, even a database as a service, but the interfaces and APIs that they present that allow me to consume that stuff as, 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 as like application code potentially and driving that infrastructure as code sort of uh, approach. Cool. Uh, you guys all do a lot of things for CDI, right? You spend a lot of time with customers. You work on strategy. You work on messaging. What, what is it that you like most about being a divisional CTO at CDI? Uh, the, the, I get to talk to everybody. Width, I was going to say the width uh, of exposure, yeah, honestly. You know, you know, it's the width of exposure. It's, it's coming in and changing people's minds. It's, it's uh, you know, yeah. Like, like right. you know, 
he and I are going to be locking ourselves in a room with you to, to go and talk about a lot of important things that we need for, you know, what, what we think is going to be important in 2023, yeah. right? And starting kind of laying the groundwork and the planning for that. And then we're going to go from there and, and it's going to like, let's go talk to the delivery managers. Let's go talk to the pre-sales leaders. Mm-hmm. Let's go talk to the sales leaders and, and like start like building that messaging and, and, and get that critical mass. And it's, for me, that's immensely gratifying because, yeah. you know, one, it, it feels very appreciated across, across the board. And two, that sort of spirit of collaboration is just is just incredible. Yeah, well, it's also, I mean, it's also the opportunity to kind of poke at the new stuff that's coming down the road oh, yeah. and f- figure out like, all right, well, how does this fit into the bigger picture? Mm-hmm. You know, we've got these really really cool products, these really cool technologies and capabilities, and we've got to not only fit that into CDI's messaging, but figure out, you know, all right, well, this is going to make sense for healthcare or legal or and, yeah. and, and you know work, work that into you know our customers' lives, and it's, it's a cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's great when like you see, it's like assembling the, the different groups together and w- like watch what happens when you put everybody in a room together and it's, it's yeah. like it's, it's very cool right because you can sort of lean on each other mm-hmm. uh, bounce ideas back and forth in fact we were most of us were just yesterday in Dallas with a customer mm-hmm. right and like being able to bring that to a customer you bring the whole team of people you have people sort of cycling in and out like there aren't many integrators in the space that can have the meeting we had yesterday. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. Is really, really. Oh, cool. abs- yeah, definitely. Really cool. Yeah, I think I think the feeling of never feeling like you're 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 the one pulling the canoe, right? There's always someone who knows as much or more than you, right? And and you know, two heads are always better than one. That's great. And, and we have the luxury of having more heads yep. that that all know a lot of things, right? Well, and and there's sort of, always slightly different opinions, or you know, you left that little nugget out, and yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thesis of the whole project. It's like you start taking these great things and putting them together, and mm-hmm. you know, you, there's there's a multiplier effect. Mm-hmm. But it's really, really, co- really cool. Yep. Um, any last words? Anything you want anybody to know about you? I'm dying for you to tell the cat story. Can you please tell the cat <laughs> story? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. I was gonna say yeah, this is a, the super short version. So um, <laughs> that, that, that it, so it certainly can't be in real time because we'd be here for a long time. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, so uh, back when I worked for, uh, worked for J.P. Morgan, I lived in Delaware. Um, had a roommate, had a cat. Um, went away to actually I think it was a Microsoft conference and. Um, uh, while I was gone, my roommate was a musician. He was going to a gig. Uh, he went to leave, arms loaded up. Cat got out, couldn't catch him. So we we, I mean, we spent months looking for this cat, um, and you know signs and everything. So you know, fast forward to about what was it, six months ago now. Well, um, it, so how how long ago was that though? You said J.P. Morgan, but let's put a a time frame to that. So. Uh, 16 years. Okay, 16, okay, yeah, 16 yeah. years Ooh, ago. Yeah. 16 years ago, Cat yeah, ran away. I'm trying to do the math to come up with the year. Okay. Like 2004 somewhere. Okay. Like, yeah. 16 so, years. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you know, about six months ago, I'm, I'm actually on the phone with one of our other uh, essays, and um, I get a, you know, my phone's blowing up, you know, on, on, on my desk, and I kind of bat it off to the side. Finally, I get a text message, and I'm like, what in, you know, is going on? I pick it up. And I read it out loud, and you know, the, the, uh, the, this this essay is like a huge animal person, and so I, I read him the text message. I'm like, what? and it basically says, you know, your cat has been found. Call like this vet or whatever. And, I'm like, <laughs> and he's like, what are you talking? Like, so he asked me, you know, he's, he's like, well, did you have a cat? I'm like, well, I did, but like. We're talking like 15 years ago, man. Like, there's no like they must have recycled the number or something like that. <laughs> what a cat! Right. So, turns out what happened is basically they found this cat. Chips had Y2K problems. But. Yeah. So, 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 some somebody found this cat. Um, it had had an accident. It had an injured leg, uh, and so they brought it into the vet thing. It was going to need to be put down, and the vet scanned for a microchip. And ding, you know, Jason McHenry. So, so they call me. It's amazing. Yeah. So, so we go. We pick the cat up. Sure enough, you know. How's six, the cat doing? Uh, well, uh, you want the honest answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. You don't let him by the door. <laughs> no, no, no. So, uh, so he was incredibly old. He passed away about a month ago. Oh, but, I'm sorry. No, he had he had, he had a be great, old enough. We to gotta edit that this point. out he, now. <laughs> no, he had a, he had a great five months. I mean, no, don't don't get me wrong. It, it was awesome. Like, I mean, we kind of got to spend you know spend that time with him. But you know, you laugh about going for the door. So he was hurt when you know when we got him. Um, kind of got you know healed up a little bit. Got got mobile again, and sure enough, as soon as he could get around, anytime that door opened, he was you know, heading right for it. I'm like, hmm. dude, 
16 years that you spent on the street. You've got a warm, like, but yeah. And wow. the call it's like on the news and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you were yeah, famous. Yeah, CBS about News. That's yeah. how I found yeah. out. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> okay, I thought you were joking, but it turned out to be <laughs> totally true. Well, no, so, so the, yeah, the worst is I, I wake up to a Teams message one morning from Chris Black. And it's like, that's why right. is Jason McHenry on my TV with a picture of this? That's how we all found out. It's an amazing story. Oh. oh my gosh! Well, I, we embarrassed Jason. Yeah, I, I'm, so, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm tell, sorry. Tell us something about you that uh, mm. that nobody knows. Oh man! This is a getting to know you podcast. Oh, yeah. mm. 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 No? That nobody us. knows. Um, somebody might not know about. Yeah. You watching. Them. I I've got a thing for for cars and photography. There you go. Mm. I like that. I've I've had lots of lots of them. I would say probably over forty cars. Almost fifty cars. Uh, definitely not all of them running. What's your favorite one? Favorite uh, you know, my favorite car at the moment. Uh, it's an old two thousand six Volkswagen GTI that I built with my son. That's um, cool. Right on down to every nut and bolt was off. It was down to a bare frame. And uh, now, do you like the car? Or do you like what you put? No, on it's it. I, I we had it's a lot of fun building it and it, tuning yeah. it, and it's you know we've written three hundred and some files for it, and and <laughs> uh, all the ECU tuning and electronics and mapping, and yeah, it's fun. Very cool. How about you? What are you? What are you? I mean, into when I was not? on the news once, uh, uh, the <laughs> national news, but uh, not for anything terribly exciting. Uh, I was standing in line at uh, outside a mother's diner uh, shortly after Katrina, and my zip code had just reopened uh, to let people back into the city, and so I was like, well, I want some lunch, and the only place that's open is Mother's Diner, and so CNN is panning across, and there's me, and my tubby self, standing in line, getting ready to order some biscuits and gravy and sausage. So, <laughs> so you like to eat. Oh, I love to eat. Oh my goodness! I, you know, and I, I'm, a, I'm a, I get to eat like at a food truck that's like a walking health code violation to like <laughs> three Michelin star restaurants. I, I, lo- I just, I clearly love to eat. Uh, and of course, you know, who doesn't love good wine, good beer, and good whiskey? Yeah. I mean, that's, and you are the best dressed man at CBS. Always. Yeah, I, you know, Every, I don't think I've oh, ever seen you in anything but a three piece. That's my favorite. Any time Russell of the day. Story. No, yeah. that's my favorite Russell Russell story. So we're we're on a you know, meeting. You know, your West Coast. It was <laughs> like a nine a.m. meeting. So it was like you know, crack of the morning. Oh, yeah. for you. And you know, somebody's like, "All right, Russell." Put on your camera. I need to see the proof that you're like, well, I'll do it, but you're not going to be able to see me because I'm on the porch and it's still dark. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so there's the silhouette of Russell, and then slowly, like, the sun comes the sun up. Comes and up. Yeah. And just like, oh. <laughs> into light. A new day dawns on CDI. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Russell in his suit. And I'm suit. still in my suit. <laughs> <laughs> love it. That is yep. amazing. I love, love it. it. All right, cool. Well, hey, it was fun getting to know you yeah. guys yeah. on this. Thanks for having us. This was a good time. Uh, look out for these guys on a future episode of the CTO podcast. You're going to start seeing them a lot more. We're super lucky to have them, and, and the other members of the office of the CTO are super blessed to have you know everybody on the team. Uh, it's been super rewarding getting to know you guys and uh, being a part of the part of the CDI journey. So mm-hmm. uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you all soon on a future episode of the CTO podcast. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, guys. The CDI CTO podcast is brought to you by CDI. Hosted by Will Huber and produced by Alyssa Hall and Spencer Grogan. To learn more about CDI, you can visit CDILLC.com. The CDI CTO podcast is a production of CDI Studios.